I think it's such a great franchise because if you held a gun to my head and said you can only pick one, I would seriously struggle because each film you pick, there is stuff from another film you would miss out on. I want to pick X, but then I miss the monologue from Pearl. I want to pick Pearl, but then I miss the fun nature of Maxine. I want to pick Maxine, but then I miss the gritty, brutal nature of X. All right, so I was driving back after seeing Maxine and I realized how much I love the X franchise. I couldn't stop thinking about the fact that each film individually works as its own film. I feel like there were people in the audience for Maxine that did not know X existed and did not know Pearl existed. And it's such an exciting prospect that people are going to check out any of these films and then slowly realize that it's actually part of a greater franchise where each film is clearly different in style and tone and themes, but somehow all three films work well together as a combined trilogy. I think it's just so incredible what Ty West and Mia Goth have pulled off here. Somehow you can pretty much watch this franchise in any order, whether it's chronological, whether it's reverse chronological, whether it's release order, and it's a fulfilling, exciting experience. I know people in my lives that watch Pearl without knowing X existed, which felt crazy to me at the time. But re-watching this trilogy for this video, I totally get how that works. You could start with Pearl and then watch X and then watch Maxine, and that could be really rewarding as well. I absolutely love the idea that Pearl is the villain of the first film X, but then she's the main character and the main point of empathy and sympathy in her own film Pearl. And I think after watching Pearl, X is a more rewarding experience. And after watching X, Pearl is a more rewarding experience. And obviously after watching those films, Maxine is really rewarding and really fulfilling in my opinion. So today I wanna to talk about this franchise as a whole. I wanna talk about each film in release order, what I think carries over thematically and little interesting things I noticed. So first off, let's talk about X. I think X is this middle ground out of the trilogy where it definitely feels like it's trying to call back some technical elements and the look of films that came out from around the time period that this film is set in. However, some things like the gore effects and the soundtrack and the sound mixing at different points do feel modern. So I think you get a really fun blend of a film that you can show to modern audiences that still has a bit of a nostalgic retro feel, but it's not as abundant as Pearl and Maxine in terms of that like retro aesthetic and vibe that they're going for. I think this film can still work for modern audiences without them having to realize that it's a pastiche and an homage the way the other films might actually need that sort of disclaimer. I think on paper, it's the most straightforward of the three films. Pearl is definitely the more art house, somber, slower, sort of like awards contender of the three films. But I think X is actually deceptively thematically rich. I think this film has so much to say about shame and sexuality and violence and aging and like repetitive cycles of trauma. I think it actually goes over a lot of people's heads because it is seen as a trashy, pulpy slasher. First off, it completely subverts the final girl trope. Typically in horror movies, the most promiscuous girl is the one that is killed first. But in this film, she is actually the one that survives. And the girl that is punished the most is the most kind of like conservative, the church mouse character played by Jenna Ortega. Another thing I love is the way this film talks about aging and resentment and this inbuilt disdain for your own life that you've built yourself. Pearl is a really tortured, awful character at different points. But some empathy shines through even if you haven't seen Pearl. You can tell this is a woman that just wants to be held and touched the way she used to be or used to long to be. And when she looks at Maxine and sees how promiscuous and sexually free she is, it like unsettles her because she secretly hates herself for never being able to channel that and embrace that in her own life. Pearl is definitely a victim of circumstance given what we know from the film Pearl. However, the way she kind kind of like takes out her own personal trauma on this cast of people trying to make a smut film is awful and relentless and cruel. I love the sequence where Pearl hits on Maxine in front of the photo of Pearl when she was younger. I think the film is just firing on all cylinders. What do you expect? First off, both characters are played by Mia Goth at this point. Pearl and Maxine aren't related, but I love the idea that Pearl is showing Maxine a photo of Pearl when she was younger, and it looks like Maxine. It's haunting, it's weird, it's strange. Neither of the characters point it out, but as an audience member, you're like, oh, that's unsettling. Like, what's this trying to say about generational cycles and like passed on trauma, you know, and almost like vant and pain that you take on from other people just being in their orbit. I think it's so fascinating. And 
and it's the film firing on all cylinders. And I absolutely love the idea that they hint that in the basement, there is a body of someone who has been used as a sex slave. It's a haunting, creepy visual, and they don't really linger on it for too long. It's really just there for observant viewers. But the idea that Howard has been going out to find like innocent victims to be Pearl's slave is so unhinged, so chaotic, and so dark. On top of that, I think the core cast of characters here is genuinely excellent. I think this is the best ensemble cast out of the three films. All the characters here are absolute bangers. The smart director, the one dating Maxine, is hilarious. Now, if she's serious, which I suspect she is, well, she's gonna do it whether you like it or not. He's funny. He's surprisingly caring in an industry that is typically seen to exploit people. He really seems to care about the safety and well-being of most of the people there, except RJ. He definitely manipulates and plays with RJ. But to be honest, I don't think anyone likes RJ that much. He's a bit of an annoying bastard. I also think the church mouse character played by Jenna Ortega is excellent. And I think the themes of sexuality that are explored through her is really well done as well. All right, while we're talking about church mouse and RJ, can we just unpack the situation that unfolds when she decides to feature in the smut film? Because I think it's genuinely insane. Obviously we are positioned to not like RJ. He talks down to church mouse. He's really cruel at different points, really condescending. I completely agree, but I don't know if the punishment fits the crime. I know as audience members, we are meant to be sitting there going, fuck yeah, church mouse, you get in that smutty film and make him feel bad. But if we apply real world standards and morals here, she basically just decided without his consent to open up their relationship and like get on camera and make him film it. It's absolutely wild and insane. On top of that, after doing that, she has the audacity, she has the goal to run around and go, oh, I hope RJ isn't mad. I think I hurt his feelings. I, I woke up and, and he was gone. I you don't think he left me, do you? He's probably just processing things, you know? You know, initially the way I looked at this situation was, oh, she's clearly featuring in this smutty film because she's sick of RJ dragging her down and being cruel. And this is basically her way of saying, we're over. Look, we're done. I'm sleeping with someone else. Goodbye. But then afterwards, she actually goes chasing after him and wanting to like reconnect with him. So I find her behavior really confusing. Obviously, RJ was being annoying and uh, I think she should have dumped his ass because I, I think she's way too good for him. But I think the way it played out and general audience response I think RJ is slightly hard done by. But the way audiences have reacted to this situation and basically being like, RJ was a dick. He deserved everything he got. I'm like, I'm not sure if the ends justify the means here. I am not sure if it's an exact one-to-one. -one. I think breaking up with him first would have made a lot more sense in my opinion. I actually really like the subtle storytelling here too, because at the start of the movie, Church Mouse is really mad at RJ for getting her involved in smut production without letting her know. She looks down on these people and the movie they are making, whereas RJ is the one that's like, chill, be free. It's just sex, babe. And I really like that because then later in the movie, when she starts kind of like getting involved in the sound and clearly starts getting a bit titillated, a bit excited and a bit enamored, right? She starts to have a bit of a sexual awakening. RJ is quickly intimidated. You can tell that maybe there's some insecurity in him about his performance in that department, in their relationship. And he starts getting really confronted. So it's cool for him to be like, oh, you gotta be sexually open and free but then he is instantly like unsettled when she wants to get involved. And yes, I do stand by the fact that I think uh, basically sleeping with someone, whether it's on camera or not, is a bit unfair on RJ, but I think the relationship dynamics that are brought up here and kind of like subtly shown are really interesting and make this a really fascinating situation to kind of unpack. On top of that, I love at the end of the movie, clearly after she's kind of let some walls down and explored the world of smart filmmaking, when things go wrong, when RJ is killed, when Jenna Ortega is freaking out because she's like injured and she wants to escape, she actually takes out on Maxine. And you can tell, yes, obviously she's like scared and frazzled and like angry at Maxine for just like being in this situation. But it also feels like she is mad at Maxine for like corrupting her. I never should have listened to you. This is all your fault. Right? Like, oh, I, I got down on your level and did a smutty film and now my life is fucked, you know? We need to stick together. I hate you. And I think it's just really interesting and well done. I really, really like the storyline here and what it's trying to say. But outside of that, I think Kid Cudi is another great example. And I absolutely love his dynamic with Howard, the old killer guy on this estate, on this farm. I find this dynamic like darkly, comically hilarious because basically the moment Howard meets Kid Cudi's character, he wants to murder him. He literally is like foaming at the mouth to murder Kid Cudi. But Kid Cudi is constantly walking around going like, hey, Pops, how are you doing? Pops, let's go find your wife. 
I absolutely love the section where Howard is literally about to murder Kid Cudi. Meanwhile, Kid Cudi is walking through the lake being like, Pops, are you okay? Are you having a heart attack? Pops, where are you? What happened? It's so darkly funny to me. I also think the film's storytelling operates really well here too. It's alluded to the fact that Howard, aka Pops, clearly has some like racial bias and hatred towards Kid Cudi's character due to the fact that he served in the Civil War. They never clarify which side of the Civil War he served in, but I think it's a really interesting character tidbit that they give Howard. I also love the idea that Howard is just walking around fulfilling Pearl's wishes and this dovetails really nicely into the ending of Pearl where after witnessing Pearl basically murder her entire family, he decides to stay with her. So it's really actually well done that in both movies, he's helping her and enabling her in her awful schemes. And I think the fact that in this movie, it is implied that they aren't just getting murdered, but some of them are being chosen as sex slaves is really disturbing and fascinating. I also love the idea that she is really enamored with Maxine. You know, part of it is she sees herself in Maxine. She sees what she could have been. She sees the star potential and the fact that Maxine goes for what she wants. And it's this simultaneous hatred and resentment, but also like admiration and lust. I just think it's so well done. I also think the character played by Brittany Snow, who had a relationship with the guy from Selling OC is incredible. I think she's fantastic here. I love how much fun she's having with the role. And I just wish we got more of her because I think this ensemble cast is genuinely excellent. Excellent. Also, some of the soundtrack moments in this film are just genuinely perfect. I love the Phil the Reaper soundtrack. I know it's a very generic choice, but God damn it, does it work in that scene where we get our first gory kill of the movie? Also, while we are talking about the gore in this film, I think it's excellent. As I mentioned before, out of the three films, this one has the most modern sensibilities in its use of music and also its gore. I think the gore in this film is gritty and realistic, but it doesn't feel old and out of date and old fashioned. It feels like it could be in most modern films. Whereas in Pearl, that feels very technicolor and overly bright. And in Maxine, it genuinely feels like it belongs in like a dated Friday the 13th movie. They really steer into, let's make it a product of the time we are trying to set it in. But X, I think as an individual movie probably works the best. I think it's the most fascinating. I think you get the most well-rounded story and you get a good combination of stories that follow Maxine and Pearl. Obviously Pearl is just focused on Pearl and Maxine is just focused on Maxine, but X is where they meet in the middle very intentionally. And I think it's really interesting because X wasn't initially conceived as a trilogy. It came out as an original film and then they decided to make Pearl pretty much on a whim and then they rushed out Maxine shortly after but I just think what they've managed to pull off here, even if it's retroactive, is so excellent. Also, going back to the soundtrack, I absolutely love the rendition of Wee Wee Marie and Ave Maria that comes in at the end of the movie. I think it's so empowering and exciting as she's walking off from this house of horror, picking up the axe and getting ready to run over Pearl and this music starts playing. It's so well done. <laughs> And I also love that when we watch Pearl, we see that Pearl used to listen to a version of that song in the old timey movie she watched. Just such a great little detail that they've added to this film. Some more parallels I really appreciate. There's this section where the smut film is being filmed and it is lining up with a situation between Maxine and Pearl. It's the lemonade situation. And I love that both situations end with someone basically saying, quick, you need to leave before daddy gets home. You need to leave before the man of the house gets home. It is a consistent theme throughout this film and Pearl that the idea of like women can only be themselves and only act on their nature when the man is out of the house, when the man is away. And I think it's just really well done. It's explored in this film through the character of Howard leaving the estate at different points. Also the fictional daddy in the smut film that they're filming. And also in Pearl, that is a situation that happens time and time again. I think it's really well done and just like well-earned parallels in this movie. I should probably get back now. My boyfriend gets real fussy when he don't know where I'm at. Come with me before daddy gets out. If daddy catches us, there's no telling what he might do. What are you doing? You should go. We are sacred. 
And yeah, my favorite thing about this movie is just how much it commits to the bit of kind of like trying to remove shame and stigma around sex. I love the idea that it's an inverse and it's punishing the most kind of like conservative characters and rewarding the most sexually promiscuous characters for the most part. Pearl seems genuinely like she has a bee in her bonnet about the people being so sexually promiscuous on her grounds and she seems extra revved up and angry to murder them as a result. And I love that Howard is constantly trying to feed and appease her sexual appetite at different points and shame it at other points and like try and restrain it and bring it in. I think the dynamic between Howard and Pearl and sexuality in this movie is just so well done. And I love that for Maxine as a character, it's way more simple, it's way more clinical and she can disconnect from it and it's something way easier for her to manage. And this is something that is brought up in Maxine as well. But yeah, I love this movie. I think it's way more dense and thematically rich than people give it credit for. I actually think if you rewatch this film, no Knowing Pearl, knowing Maxine, I think a lot of stuff really jumps out. I think it's a really rewarding film on rewatch. And it's just a really fun horror movie as well. Like it works on both levels. Now let's talk about Pearl because I don't think Pearl operates on both levels as well. I think this is way more of a cult film, way more of an arty film. It's a bit slower. It's a bit more restrained. The pacing is interesting and funny. But my God, I love Pearl. I think every single film in this franchise, you can make a really good case for it being your favorite. And look, Pearl initially, when I watched it, I think I watched it in the wrong mood and I was a bit let down. Yes, it's not another film like X. It is not trying to be. It is a character study. And I love that this film starts at a point in Pearl's life where she's already fucking nuts. I'm not staying on this farm! What did I do wrong? Nothing. Calm down. No! All right, like this film doesn't start and it's a slow descent into madness. Her mom literally says to her, like, I see all the violent, sexually depraved things you do in your spare time. Like you keep doing it, stop doing it. It's uncomfortable and weird. And someday people are gonna find out who you really are. Like the core story for Pearl in this movie is the fact that she has this nature inside her that she fears everyone is eventually gonna find out. That's why she loves acting so much because she can immerse herself in a different character in a picture perfect version of herself. I think this movie is so good. I don't know what I was on when I first watched it because I think it is actually really quite interestingly well paced. I think it moves. I think it looks gorgeous. I think all the performances are great. And even though this film was shot during like COVID in back lots, it was a rush production. It feels a lot more alive and like living and breathing than a lot of other films I see lately. Somehow this feels like a more lived in breathing world than a lot of like Netflix movies that come out. I think it's so well done. All right. The thing I love about this movie is that Pearl actually starts nuts. Like Pearl is nuts from the start of the movie. Yes, she gets more nuts, but we don't meet someone who's full of empathy and we really understand her journey. This isn't a story of someone who wanted to be an actress and then was abused by the system and cracked and turned nuts. Uh, she's nuts from the jump. Now, yes, her mother is awful to her. She is cruel to her. And I love that the way the mother is cruel to Pearl isn't just a carbon copy of Pearl and Maxine's dynamic in X. It's very different and specific to these two characters. But I just think the fact that like basically from the jump, Pearl is hurting animals. She's being cruel. She has a pet alligator that she feeds chickens. She is screaming about wanting to be a star despite not having much experience. I think, yes, we do have some inbuilt empathy for her character because of what she's going through with her father and her mum. but it isn't revealed to the end just how tragic her backstory is. And it makes us look back on the entirety of the film and go, oh my God, like that poor thing. I totally get why she was fractured from the start of this movie. You know, the fact that Howard, instead of taking her away from her awful home and awful family instead decided to stay in that awful home, in that awful family, and then went off to war, leaving her to go nuts, sexually frustrated, feeling abandoned, and having to navigate her awful family dynamics is just heartbreaking. On top of that, you find out at one point that she was carrying his baby, and the way she talks about the fact that like it felt like this thing that she didn't want, sucking the life from her, she hated how it felt. It's dark and haunting. I just think it's such a good monologue, and it makes you look back on the film up until that point completely differently. Pearl at different times came off as entitled and nuts and like delusional, but given what she's been through, you kind of get it. And I absolutely love the audition sequence. <laughs> Thank you. 
where it's this interesting moment of, yes, she isn't like unbelievably talented, but there are these little pockets where you can see that she could be a great performer. <laughs> There are some parts where it feels like it's making a mockery of her. I love the sound of her slapping her legs. It feels like a great comic punchline. But then there is these moments where they add her into a fantasy sequence and you see that if it was actually actualized, if she made it to the films, if she had backup dancers, she would fit the part. She would fit in just as much as any of these other girls. And I love that the casting directors basically say that to her. They say, yeah, you're not bad. You actually did pretty well, but we've got plenty of girls like you. I think it's a tragic moment because all she can do is emulate the girl she sees on screen. I absolutely love the character of the film projectionist. He is literally listed as the projectionist on Google. Google. I think it is a pitch perfect performance because they never take it as far as to make him a flat out like Harvey Weinstein me too type but he is definitely weird and smarmy and gross the choice to show Pearl the kind of smut film and be like this is going to be the future of film and I could see you in one of those it feels weird and it feels off yes everything they engage in is consensual and he's not even that high up he's not that powerful but it just feels like weird and icky and she's obviously incredibly sheltered and he's using that nature to his advantage. I feel really bad for Pearl in this situation because yes, she knows what she's doing. She knows that she's cheating. He didn't make any like false promises to her, but I think the dynamic here between them is really interesting because she's clearly placing all her insecurities into him and he just doesn't get it. He's not built for that. He's not cut out for that. He's not here for a relationship. I love the moment that she brings him home to her fucked up household and you can just see the disconnect there. Like he does not have it in him to even begin to start navigating the world and life of Pearl and like can you really blame him like the mother is downstairs begging for her life and she just lied to him about having a dog what's its name we don't have a dog I thought you said you uh, did in the cellar oh um, right I absolutely love the unhinged conversation they have where she goes like, why are you leaving me? And he goes, no, no, I'm not. And she like cuts him off and screams. It's so funny to me. I think Mia Goss performance here is genuinely excellent. What did I do wrong? Nothing. Calm down. No! Why are you leaving me if I didn't do anything wrong? I don't understand. I thought you liked me! I absolutely love how much of an unhinged chaotic queen she is in these scenes. Like there's a certain point in this movie where every interaction she has is just her screaming. I think it's excellent. And somehow it never gets too over the top or too comical. I think it's just a really exhilarating performance to watch. And I absolutely love watching this woman just like slowly lose her marbles even more than she had at the start of the film over the course of this film's runtime. While we're talking about the projectionist, I absolutely love the section where she fucks the scarecrow. I think it's just such a good, weird, strange section. I love that when she climaxes, it's framed as like a horror movie sting. The crows fly off in a dramatic fashion. It's just so cool. Like, I don't know what Ty West and Mia Goth were on when making these films, but I want some of it. Like, it's so funny to me. I think like... It's just like so well done to me. It's just so entertaining. I also love the sequence where she looks at the scarecrow and the projectionist guy's face pops in, clearly showing the guilt that she's feeling about cheating on her husband. And even the fact that her pleasuring herself with the scarecrow also feels like infidelity and cheating. I just think it's so well done and it brings back the themes of sexual repression and shame that were in the film X into Pearl in a really organic, well done way. I also love what it says about Pearl's relationship with sexuality in X, right? because to me, what it feels like is Pearl feels such regret for cheating on Howard, a loyal guy, right? He is really loyal at the end of Pearl and incredibly loyal in X. She feels such guilt about cheating on him that she then takes that out on the people of the smut film set in X. I think it's really fascinating. I also love when Howard gets home at the end of the film and sees all the bodies of the people that Pearl has murdered and he doesn't even know what to do with that information. Like he's horrified. And the reason I love that is maybe he got like the ick, right? Like he couldn't leave, right? Cause he's terrified that Pearl would also kill him. And he's like, well, what other life do I know? I've just come back from war. I've just killed people. I'm a bit mentally strange too. Like we can live together forever. 
but clearly like maybe that caused a sexual rift between them too because it's like i can't constantly witness you being crazy and murdering people and then still want to sleep with you pearl like I, I just can't do it i love to picture what their relationship looks like between pearl and x what their dynamics look like you know the way that conversation went down and i love that ty west and mia goth don't actually give it to us. I love that this film is basically just her waiting for her husband to get home. And then when he gets home, she just says, hey, I'm so happy you're home. And then they hold that smile for like five minutes. And I love Mia Goss performance here because you can see the physical exertion it takes to fake a smile for five minutes coming through in her face. You see her face get redder. You see the veins. You see almost tears start forming. It's so well done. I think it sums up the chaotic violent crazy tone of this film just so so well some other things i love i love the moment where she like squeezes an egg and it hard cuts to her husband exploding like in a fantasy sequence i just think it's like a really well done edit i love the split screen montage at the end of this film where she's chopping up the friend that she murdered that she opened up to in her monologue i just think so much of this movie is so well done so interestingly well presented and yeah i think pearl as a character is just incredibly fascinating i also love the relationship between pearl and her parents because the mom is is outwardly awful at various different points, but the mum also has a tough gig too. I love the death of the mum and how that's sort of framed as an accident, but for Pearl, a happy accident. And I also love that there's this slight uncomfortable nature between the relationship of Pearl and her father. It does feel very strange that Pearl chooses to bathe in front of her father instead of wheeling him away. And it, there is a interesting unspoken dynamic that is explored there when the mother walks in on Pearl bathing in front of her husband. It's it's really strange and they don't push it too far, but it's enough for you to sit there and go, what was that about? That was weird. I also love the relationship between Pearl and her father because it's like, has it always been this positive of a relationship or is the fact that he is now non-verbal meaning she is just placing what she wants into their relationship, you know? You know, if the father was verbal, if he could verbalize, would he be as mean to Pearl as the mum is? Is the fact that he's disabled the reason they get along so well because he can't get up and be like, Pearl, you're fucking nuts. Would you shut the fuck up for just one second? But yeah, I think this movie is so effective. Somehow you still have empathy for Pearl despite all the crazy shit she does because her settings and surroundings are just so unfortunate. I mean, what else was she meant to do all day anyway, really? She was waiting for her husband to get home. She was going to get bored. So she just decided to kill a bunch of people. I mean, who can blame her? Also, while we're talking about the character of Pearl, I do just want to mention one other thing from X. There are a few lines in Pearl where she's talking about like, why can't I ever have the life I want? You know, why do I have to constantly care for my mom, care for my dad and not go for my dreams? And I love the sad conclusion. I know that X was filmed first, but I absolutely love the line in X where Pearl opens up to Howard and says, you know, why won't you touch me? Why won't you sleep with me? Why can't I ever have what I want? And it's a great reincorporation. Again, I know that X came first, but I think it's just such a great parallel and it sounds way sadder and way more defeated in X. You know, she's ready to go. She's given up on life. She's tired and frail and she never got the life she wanted that she wanted so badly in Pearl. I just think the way these two films were work together is excellent. Now let's talk about Maxine. So a few things to say about Maxine. Out of the three of them, yes, this one does feel the most kind of out of place, but I do have to say in terms of this criticism I've seen throw around, all three films are wildly, wildly different. The tonal jump and the stylistic jump between X and Pearl is pretty insane. And I know that the time difference between X and Maxine is only 10 years. So it is a bit more jarring, but I do think each film is clearly trying to be a different genre and a different style. And it's weird that this criticism is thrown so much at Maxine compared to Pearl. Now I will say in saying that out of the three films, this definitely does feel the most individual out of the three stylistically. I think out of the three, the gore is the most unrealistic, pulpy over the top like it is trying to look fake it is trying to look from those like really dumb over the top gory films of the time none of it is meant to be convincing this movie is trying to replicate the style of like b-grade films like they explicitly talk about that compared to the other films which are trying to be proper films of the time. There is a scene with a just terrible case of testicular torsion early in this film. <laughs> And it looks like basically like fake props you would have got from a costume store. And most of the gore in this film is meant to look that way. It's not a mistake. It's very, very intentional. But X timeline wise, it was obviously set 
before this film and the gore looks way more convincing and realistic. But another reason Maxine jumps out is because of its tone. It is so much more fun than the other two. Now, yes, X for a dark, gritty, gruesome horror movie had a lot of fun moments. There is a lot of dark humor and fun and thrills to be had in X. Pearl is like darkly comic, but both of them are straight up horrors. Maxine honestly feels like, fuck yeah, it's the 80s, Stranger Things, nostalgia. It feels like a Nino noir crime thriller more than it does a horror film. But especially in the back end, it feels like this film is trying to be a really fun action movie almost. Like a lot of the kills are framed like action sequences. There is a full on shootout in the back end of the movie. I think the reason people are complaining about this is because they wanted this trilogy to be a straight up horror franchise. Franchise. And this one, in my opinion, leans more into 80s fun nostalgia and action beats, in my opinion. But in saying all this, uh, it's so much fun. And again, yes, it doesn't really feel like a horror movie the way the other ones did. There is never a point where you're going to be like, oh my God, I can't look what's going to happen. But the gore is excellent. The characters are fun. I absolutely love what they do with Maxine's character here. She is not the same character she was in X. She knows what she's doing. She knows how to handle people. She's been through the most horrific shit in X. So when there's a guy that wants to take advantage of her in the alleyway, he doesn't stand a chance because given what she's been through, she is experienced. She knows what she's doing here. Here. Drop it! What were you gonna do, huh? Nothing. I was just playing around. Well, we're playing now. I also love that it's following her journey through Hollywood. It feels like an evolution from the journey we were following her on in X. I think the fact that when she is being approached and stalked by Kevin Bacon's character, who, by the way, in this film is genuinely like excellent, like an absolute highlight of this film. Well, I guess I only ever seen you lying on your back. John LeBet, private detective, hired to find you. She knows how to handle him. And on top of that, and on top of that, she has resources and connections that can handle it for her. Like Giancarlo Esposito's character literally goes, yo, don't even worry about it. We're going to crush him in a car compactor. Now, yes, obviously that cuts through the tension that would have been there in X, all right? She did not have the resources to call someone up and be like, hey, there's this crazy bitch that's trying to kill us all for being a bit horny. Can you come and like shoot them with a machine gun? But in Maxine, that is kind of the vibe. She has connection she has power she has influence and she's going to use it so instead i think this movie just serves as a really fun pulpy look at hollywood in that time period and i get why some people are going to be disappointed but just have fun with it i absolutely love the cop characters i love the way that she's trying to escape the past and she can't quite do it and the past is trying to catch up with her and it can't quite do it it's this really interesting tension i love the callbacks and the flashbacks to pearl and x i think it's really well executed and I'm just going to say it, I even like the twist with the dad. And I know that he is a lot goofier and a lot stranger than what he was set up to be in X in those little snippets we saw of him. Like, yes, it does undo some of the tension and mystique around his character in X. However... I actually think it's just so much fun when we get to the shootout. I've seen so many people complain about the third act of this film going way too far, way too over the top. But for me, I actually think it kind of saved the film. Because for the first part of the movie, I saw a scene there going, oh, this isn't really the horror movie I was hoping it would be. You know, this is way more campy and fun and like nostalgia bait. But I think when they full on just went for it, they full on jumped the shark and just really started having fun with the cop storyline and the dad storyline, I thought it would really start to work for me. You know, as an audience member, I just went, okay, we're clearly meant to be having fun and not taking this movie too seriously. You know, and now I can lay back, let it wash over me and just really enjoy it. And I think all the cast is really trying to sell that as well. The cop characters are goofy and silly and their tonality and banter is clearly meant to feel a bit B grade. A lot of the gore effects are silly and are over the top. Kevin Bacon's character is hammy. Like the whole movie is campy and hammy. And if you don't like that from the entry point, you're not going to like this movie. Yes, it is not as serious as the first two, but I think it still works as an excellent, excellent standalone film. Like the, my crowd was laughing throughout this film. And I think that's what you're meant to be doing. And if you are really sad and disappointed about that, I can't really help you. But in my opinion, there's still some great thematic stuff here. It is disappointing to me that this film is clearly the least sexually charged and it's exploring the themes of like aging and generational cycles and sexual shame the least. However, I do really like the idea that despite her power and influence, despite her escaping her past, her dad is actually 
actually the one that is coming back to haunt her. I love the idea that these Christians hate the sexuality that is presented from these women in Hollywood. And I think that does really tie into X really well. Instead of it being like a weird kooky old grandma, now it's this institutionalized weird Christian cult trying to take down over sexualized Hollywood. No, very similar to the cult of Charles Manson. I think it's really well done. And I love that they're a more powerful entity trying to take down the sexual starlets of the Hollywood scene. I also think it's really like tragic the way that all of Maxine's friends are getting picked off and shamed for their sexuality. I think again, it ties into the rest of the franchise really well. And I think the relief you get in the final chunk where it's an action shootout and Maxine can handle herself with a shotgun and she gets everything she wants is actually a bit empowering. It is a crowd pleasing moment. And I think it really ties off the trilogy really well. Again, going back to the order of watching these films, I think if you go in reverse timeline order, so Maxine, X, and then Pearl, it's a really tragic, depressing story, you know, because it shows here's what Pearl could have been through Maxine, and uh, here's what she ended up becoming, this poor, lonely girl on a farm. Whereas if you watch it in the other order, right, Pearl, X, and Maxine, it's really empowering and inspiring. And people have been complaining that Mia Goth's character feels really thin in Maxine, but I kind of disagree. I'm like, she didn't feel that fleshed out in X either. I think we get a lot more for her. And we're clearly meant to be able to infer that she's done a lot of character growth between the two films. You can tell she's experiencing trauma and PTSD. I felt like I got plenty from her. And, you know, it's as simple as she wants to be a star and she got to be a star. You know, it almost feels like in some way she's living Pearl's dream by the end of the movie. You know, instead of being a smart star, she's an actual Hollywood star, something Pearl could never achieve. I think this trilogy works so well together. I think it's really, really fascinating. I absolutely love it. I think all the campy stuff in Maxine is really, really fun. And you know what? I kind of like that they didn't try and do X again because I, I don't think you could have. In terms of like fun, sexually charged slasher, I don't think you can do much better than X. In terms of character study about that sort of stuff, I don't think you can do better than Pearl. So I think the approach of just going, fuck it, we're going to have fun is really good. I do not think the Sam Levinson comparisons are fair. I do not think this movie is just style over substance. I think all all three films are excellent. And I think the fact that people are having such a visceral reaction to Maxine just feels strange to me because it's very clear by like the midpoint of the movie that they aren't trying to be a scary film the way X was or a haunting film the way Pearl was. They're trying to have fun. So I think you guys also need to have fun with Maxine. Like, like that's all I can say. You know, look at me. I'm a critic that likes to analyze movies. I cannot analyze Maxine as much as I analyze X and Pearl, but I don't hate Maxine for that. And in my opinion, if anyone in my life said that any single one of these films was their favorite, I think they have a really good case. Someone could say Maxine, X or Pearl is their favorite and I wouldn't have too much to argue with. And I think it's such a great franchise because if you held a gun to my head and said you can only pick one, I would seriously struggle because even each film you pick, there is stuff from another film you would miss out on. I want to pick X, but then I miss the monologue from Pearl. I want to pick Pearl, but then I miss the fun nature of Maxine. I want to pick Maxine, but then I miss the gritty, brutal nature of X. I think all three films in this franchise are essential and they complement each other excellently. I love this franchise so much and I hope they do more. Anyways, thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe if you enjoy this video. Please let me know if there are any movies, series or franchises you want me to talk about next. Thank you so much for watching and have a lovely day.